Okay. Okay, everybody. Uh, welcome once again to the FRCS Mentor Wednesday teaching session. Um, I, as always, we're very uh, uh, glad to have you all here, and uh, we're very proud to have Walid Al Nahal, one of our early mentors, um, who's uh, working as in the Young Adult Hips as a fellow there in the Royal Orthopaedic Birmingham Children's Centre. He's going to talk to you about Young Adult Hips and. Uh, uh, I'm really looking forward to this talk because uh, so young adult hits is often a very difficult topic and it invariably does come up in the FRCS exams. Um, and uh, mastering this is something which I think uh, will help you significantly when it comes to the exams. Uh, without further ado, Waleed, it's a real pleasure to have you here. Thank you. Um, thank you, Shwan, for the uh, introduction. Uh, so, uh, as Shwen mentioned, uh, the problem with young adult hip is that it's something not uh, not a lot of us do uh, encounter during our rotations, whether you're a trainee or non-trainee. Uh, it's uh, sort of a gray zone. It's between uh, pediatrics. Uh, most of us uh, do encounter pediatrics, and most of us do encounter the older 60-plus-year-old uh, patient who comes in with hip arthritis. But that gray zone, which is between sort of uh, 16 and 50 years old, uh, that's the part that a lot of us don't encounter. Um, so there's plenty to talk about in that, but I'll sort of touch on the topics that are important, or from my point of view, at least I think are important uh, for the exam. So um, these are the three topics I uh, picked for today. Uh, adult hip dysplasia, femoral acetabular impingement, and AVN of the hip. So I'll just want to, if, if you're happy to make this a bit interactive, uh, then I think we can try to do that. Uh, this is an x-ray of a 23-year-old uh, lady, um, hip pain uh, on the right side for the past couple of years, mainly with activity. If, if anyone would uh, volunteer, give us a comment about what they could identify on the x-ray and how they would assess that patient and manage accordingly. So Metwali has volunteered. Thank you very much, Metwali. Um, Metwali? Yes, sorry. Um, thank you for volunteering. Thank you, Metwali. Thank you, thank you very much. Now, this is an ability graph of an adult hip showing the right hip shows a stabular dysplasia in the form of this, um, the stabular sourcey or the roof of the stabulum is increased more than, I think more than 10 degrees. The head is, uh, femoral head is subplexed. The center edge angle is reduced. Yes, exactly. And, the, and there is a sclerosis of the lateral part of the roof of the stabulum. Yeah, so this is, as, as uh, uh, Dr. Petwelli just uh, uh, mentioned, this is acetabular dysplasia. So how would you, if she's in, in clinic, how would you assess that patient? I would start look, watching the patient during walking. If he has any uh, gait abnormality in the form of antalgic gait or limbing or short limb gait. Uh, I would look also, I have to look for if the patient is using uh, assistive aids during walking like uh, a stick or crutches. Uh, then with the patient lying down, I will start by look at assessing the leg length discrepancy. Is it the leg length discrepancy? Is it femoral or tibial? Then I will assess the range of movement of the uh, hip. Yeah. Yes, exactly. So, so a lot of these uh, uh, are, are exactly uh, straight to the point. And we'll talk, I'll try to mention them in, in details. We'll go through them again in details. And, and once you've assessed all of that, and uh, she's got good range of motion. Um, she's got minimal leg length discrepancy, maybe half a centimeter shorter on that right side, mainly uh, femoral. Um, what would, uh, and she is in a lot of uh, pain, particularly with her uh, daily activities. She, she does play some sports, she goes to university, but just um, her day-to-day -day life in university is affected. How would you um, try to manage this patient? I will start by non-operative non treatment, which is most probably will fail in this age with such amount of dysplasia. 
then I will I will counsel the patient the possibility of um, of surgery in the form of correction of the uh, the this plastic uh, acetabulum in the form of uh, osteotum osteotomy to increase the femoral head coverage and correct the vertical or the the center edge angle. The what what osteotomy are you aware of that could correct this? In this case, the more I am aware about the, the Bernice osteotomy. Yeah, exactly. And if the patient is asking about the outcome of the osteotomy, would you, would you give her any, uh, any numbers or tell her any experience you've had with the outcome of this patient, of this osteotomy? I, I'm not sure about the exact yeah. figure of the yeah, outcome well, of this case. So we'll talk about this. So, so thank you, thank you. That was very, uh, very well put. Uh, so adult hip dysplasia is basically the same as uh, hip dysplasia in pediatrics. It's either residual from the childhood period or unrecognized dysplasia from the childhood uh, period. And the, the problem with it is that because we've got a shallow acetabulum, we've got inappropriate covering, then the forces on the acetabulum are uh, not well distributed. And then patients then uh, complain of pain because of the unequal distribution of forces, and that would then lead to arthritis. And particularly with adult hip dysplasia, there is a direct correlation and direct link between the onset of pain and the arthritis. It is thought that uh, some studies showed that around five years between the onset of symptoms and uh, the start of arthritis. And as uh, um, Dr. Matuelli uh, very well uh, sort of elaborated. The main two angles, there's plenty of angles and plenty of images and, and plenty of views you can get, but, but for the FRCS, at least from my point of view, I think that these are the two main angles that you would need to know. And these are the two angles that you can basi basically eyeball uh, just through the uh, X-ray and, 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 and just pick up. Um, so the lateral central edge angle, less than 20 degrees, this indicates frank dysplasia, between 20 and 24 is borderline. Acetabular index, more than 10 degrees, is uh, dysplasia, and between 10 and 14 is uh, borderline. And in a clinical setting, um, it's very important that any young adult presenting with uh, pain you would actually measure these angles. If you're using uh, printouts, then you would need to measure them using rulers and protractors. If you're using a computer software, then you would need to uh, use your computer software to measure these angles because they, they, could, you could, they could really sometimes fool you. There's the extrusion index, uh, uh, and uh, which we don't need to go through the details. Shenton line, most of us know the Shenton line from uh, the trauma and the hip dislocation. It's basically a disruption uh, of the uh, line between the inferior border of the uh, neck head with the, uh, in with the superior pubic ramus. And in history taking, so this is a different type of patient from our 60 year old patient who has frank uh, pain affecting his day to day life. This is a more subtle presentation. One of the things I would be sort of uh, wanting to mention to show the uh, examiner that I'm aware of, of the natural history of this disease is ask the patient when these symptoms occurred. So more than five years of symptoms then starts to ring some bells because that could then mean that arthritis has already uh, started and uh, that totally changes the management. The effect on daily activities and hobbies, particularly the hobbies, most of these patients could be actually fine with simple tasks if they have a sedentary job in an office. That might not be the problem. Their problems could be mainly in their hobbies. And that's the activity level and expectations, because some of them are quite active and their expectations might be a bit too unreal for the condition that they have. Uh, so that might need uh, to be tailored according to uh, their uh, these childhood hip problems. Uh, as I mentioned, some of these uh, uh, patients have had problems throughout childhood, and it, it's a very uh, important thing to touch on, and whether or not they've had previous surgeries, that will definitely affect your decision making, and because dysplasia has a genetic uh, prevalence and family history of hip problems as well. Examination, there'll be scars from previous surgeries, the gait, uh, uh, Trendelenburg gait or short limb gait, 
uh, they would have abductor muscle weakness because it's a long-standing uh, condition. Leg length discrepancy is very common, could be femoral. And in, in a lot of the cases, the difference is actually also in the tibial uh, uh, side, not just the femoral. Rotational profile is a key, really, uh, in assessment of these patients. A lot of them have increased femoral antiversion, which is very important whether you are aiming for hip preservation or you're aiming for a hip, aiming for a hip replacement. So when we talk about management, there really is a very important factor that will determine our management. So before, uh, what I would do in the exam, if I would put an x-ray like that, before jumping into management, part of my crucial assessment is to say, I would ask for further imaging, particularly an MRI scan, because it is the presence or absence of arthritis even if very little, very subtle arthritis that will dictate which direction I go. We have three options, basically, non-operative, a preservation option, and a hip replacement option. Non-operative, mainly for patients who have mild symptoms or asymptomatic, but the symptomatic patients who don't have arthritis, you could really argue against the option of non-operative treatment unless they refuse it because the natural history of this disease is to progress to arthritis. So if the patient is aware of that and he doesn't want surgery and he has symptoms, then that's fine as long as he knows that he is likely to develop arthritis within the next five to six years. Uh, so non-operative treatment for symptomatic, maybe not the best sort of option. Um, hip preservation, the determined factor here is that that patient doesn't have arthritis and hip replacement is our salvage procedure. Um, and when we talk about hip preservation, the most commonly performed osteotomy is the GANS periacetabular uh, osteotomy, known as the Bernese osteotomy also. Uh, there are different osteotomies in Birmingham. For example, we use the uh, Birmingham interlocking triple pelvic osteotomy. Um, however, this is the more uh, sort of common one. And um, it, I don't think we need to know much details about it for the FRCS exam, just that the reorientation osteotomy is done through a single approach and tier approach, and that in, preserves the integrity of the uh, posterior column. And that's the whole idea of the uh, uh, periacetabular osteotomy is preserving that posterior column. It does violate the triradiate cartilage. That's why it cannot be, it's not done in, uh, these skeletal and mature. So in the list of osteotomies you would find in uh, your uh, pediatrics chapter talking about uh, 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 dysplasia in children, you will not find this osteotomy in one of them uh, as one of the uh, options available. So the results originally GANS reported an 82% survivorship at 11 years and 60% at 20 years. The poor outcome as would be expected is hip arthritis and older age. And more or less, these results are reproducible. And initially, there was a high complication rate. The initial studies showed complications of up to 20%, but with uh, better surgeon experience and more of, more of these cases being done, uh, the complication rate has gone down to 4 or 5%. So this is the topic of hip dysplasia. And uh, it's, it's really quite simple. And I don't think for the FRCS, we uh, you'll be probed uh, to go much deeper uh, than that. Um, I think it's, it's just uh, basic knowledge, but it is a, a, a topic that I think is of importance for the exam. If you cannot uh, recognize hip dysplasia, diagnose it, and at least direct the patient to the appropriate service, then that is uh, a huge problem. Um, next, we'll talk about the second option, a, a hip replacement option. And this is a classical FRCS sort of uh, question. And if, if uh, someone else can volunteer, have a look at this x-ray and uh, tell me what they're thinking of, what their concerns are uh, regarding this patient and how they would address these concerns. Metawali. Metawali Said. Yes, I, I already participated in a little bit of yeah, more. Already. Already, okay, I'm sorry. No more, no. Niaz. No more. Yeah. Hi. Hi, how are you, Norman? Good. I'm good, thank you. How are you? Good. So tell me, Norman, what would you, what are your thoughts? So this is a review of uh, pelvis is polymer to uh, female uh, of 40 years of female. Uh, I can see there is a, a deformity of the right 
uh, head of femur and is uh, proximally uh, migrated um, with the uh, uh, subluxation of the uh, right uh, right hip. Um, if I uh, categorize it as per uh, hypophilic this uh, classification, it is uh, type B, uh, and uh, uh, it is about fifty percent translated proximally. Um, I want to know more about uh, the history of this patient. Uh, so she has got 10 years history of hip pain and uh, need to know uh, how much pain she has got. Is she, uh, how much affecting her day-to-day uh, -day activities um, and what are her hobbies, occupation, and uh, how much she has got a pain-free uh, mobility before she gets pain and uh, any treatment so far. Uh, is she using any uh, food, shoe raise uh, on that side? Um, and other medical problems. Okay, that's perfect. And and um, so she is. She works as a nurse. Uh, this is definitely affecting her day to day life. She's missing out on her uh, work on several occasions because of the hip pain she's in. She's been trying to put up with it for the past uh, ten years. She's had hip injections before. Uh, they only last her for a couple of months. She's not had any surgeries though. Um, uh, she's at a point in her life where she needs something done. And she is wearing a shoe race, yes, about a centimeter and a half. Right. So I will uh, I will sit with her, discuss with her the further options, which is uh, the surgical option in this case. Um, and this is arthritic hip plus the, the sublux. So uh, hip replacement is the option uh, uh, that I will discuss with her. Yeah. Uh, so. Uh, uh, the aim of my um, management is to restore the center of rotation of the hip uh, and, and uh, to achieve the leg length uh, and uh, uh, offset of the hip. Uh, possibly, uh, uh, I will do the total hip replacement uh, uncemented uh, on both sides um, and uh, possible osteotomy of the proximal femur uh, to, uh, in case if we have to lengthen more than uh, two centimeters. Exactly. Okay. And, and why, why do you want to restore the hip center? Why, why don't you just keep this hip center as high as it is now? Um, if I, uh, uh, there are pros and cons uh, for both. Uh, to achieve the native uh, hip center, uh, there will be less uh, joint breaking forces and it will be more anatomical. Um, and uh, 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 and uh, uh, the offset will be restored better uh, with the native hip center. For high hip center, uh, there are going to be more uh, 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 more proximal forces uh, across the hip, and it's less stable, and uh, and uh, going to be uh, short as well, and like uh, the shortening of the leg as well. So, uh, I will and, and to... survivorship also. Uh, so, in addition to what you mentioned, they also the survivorship of the hip is better. When you put it in the in the uh, native center, because you got better bone stock uh, there. So right. yeah, okay. no, thank you, thank you, Noah. So that was uh, very well put. So um, let's 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 try to go through this again uh, through the slides and just sort of elaborate on in everything <laughs> that we've talked about. So <clears throat> what I would what I would sort of um, uh, say or or start the saying is that this is a complex case. It needs a an arthroplasty surgeon, and preferably a senior arthroplasty surgeon, who has special interest in these types of cases. And it's very important to mention also preoperative planning in these cases. I wouldn't go in uh, with an x-ray alone. A CT scan is important. Look at where, where I have bone stock. Look at also a CT scanogram. Look at the leg length discrepancy. And uh, you can be fooled again by the leg length discrepancy. It, although we know it has a high hip center, this could be compensated by the tibia, for example. And uh, she might have differences in the tibial leg length. So all of that sort of needs to be put into uh, consideration. And um, these are, there's two main classifications uh, you can look at. There's the heart of the classification system. Uh, this patient would be a, a type B, um, as uh, Norman mentioned. And there's also the Crowley's classification, but it's a more complex one and involves measuring the pelvic height and uh, the amount, the percentage of uh, proximal displacement from the pelvic height. So I would then uh, put the challenges I can see in that case and try to propose different um, solutions for these challenges. So the challenge number one is the high hip center. 
and the insufficient um, coverage of the acetabulum. So that's on the acetabular side. It's also important to measure the challenges on the femoral side. We've got abnormal offset, we've got a vulgus neck, we've got abnormal femoral virgin in most of these patients. Again, you would probably only, you would recognize that by examination, but, but take care that these are arthritic patients and, and uh, you might not be able to do a proper rotational profile uh, given their lack of uh, rotation. So uh, this is better elaborated in a CT scan. Uh, you would have a narrow canal, which is very common in these patients and could affect your choice of implant, uh, depending on the size of the canal. And they have a uh, leg length discrepancy. Plus, if they've had previous surgeries, you've got scar tissue from previous surgery. So uh, on the acetabulum, it's important that you plan it well with a CT. And in some centers, they would also go ahead and print out uh, 3D planning uh, um, uh, using 3D using 3D uh, printing uh, uh, printers to, to sort of look at the anatomy and look at and appreciate where the areas of bone stock uh, are, and the aim is, as we mentioned, to restore the hip center. This increases the longevity because it has better bone stock, and it also reduces the forces across the uh, acetabulum. And we have to reconstruct the acetabular defect. This could be done by bone grafts or by uh, uh, augments. On the femoral side, we mentioned there's problems with the virgin and the offset. Now there's a variety of ways you can address the changes on the virgin of the offset. One of the options is using the modular stem. This is one of the uh, stems that are used in these cases called the SROM by Depuy. Uh, you can use a cemented uh, exeter, a small cemented exeter, which would um, you could then uh, change the virgin accordingly. Uh, and as we know with the Exeter, you have different uh, options of offset. Um, you, or uh, in some extreme cases, you go for custom made implants. Um, for the leg length discrepancy, you have to go in with a plan. How much leg length discrepancy do you have and how much do you want to correct and whether or not you need a femoral osteotomy. Um, in these cases where you need a femoral osteotomy, they would then do a subtrochanteric shortening osteotomy. And if there is a rotation of uh, deformity, then that would be corrected uh, with the uh, shortening. And as we mentioned, the narrow canal, you need to choose your implant based on the canal size. And um, you have to be aware of the risk of periprosthetic fracture during the surgery. So, so that's, that's how probably I would try to, to, to approach it. I would, I would put the concerns and then uh, put the solutions. And according to the case I have, if they want me to put which solution you would choose, I'd probably go for the simpler one. So, so if, if for this case, for example, um, uh, leg length difference is probably not huge. Yes, on the acetabular side, we'll aim to restore the hip center. On the femur side, you can use a uh, cemented exeter uh, uh, and probably not need a uh, shortening osteotomy because we're talking about a centimeter and a half. More than uh, three centimeters is when you would worry about uh, the leg length difference and the sciatic nerve injury that could happen uh, following the leg length difference and then you would need a uh, shortening osteotomy. Okay. Um, Next, if we go to um, a third uh, case, um, if someone wants to uh, mm -hmm. take the hot seat, uh, again, a, a simple one. Yeah. Honey has volunteered uh, to yeah. cover this topic. Thank you, Honey. Hi, no worries, hi. So this is a- Yeah, go ahead. 23 years old, the male patient was a football player with right hip pain with activity. So um, uh, this is a plain X-ray of a skeletally mature patient. I cannot see any obvious abnormality in the plain X-rays, uh, but given the history that he has got pain with activity, I would be concerned about uh, fibroastabular impingement. I would like to take history and do clinical examination. That's perfect. Um, so what? What points are you going to uh, ask him in the history and what things are you going to focus on in the clinical examination? 
So in the history, I would ask about um, what is the main, uh, main presenting complaint for the patient? Is it the pain? Is it the limitation of uh, movement? And uh, I will ask about the, um, uh, how, ha how long he had the symptoms, how is it affecting his daily activities, what treatment he had received so far, what is his expectations from coming and seeing us? What is um, the, given that he's young, I would also ask about the past medical history, but given he's 23 year football player, I don't think he would have a significant past medical history. Um, and then I will examine the uh, hip, looking for the uh, limitation of movement, the positive uh, father test, deflection, abduction, and internal rotation. I would uh, assess the neurovascular status of the limb and um, I would uh, ask for a CT and MRI arthrogram to assess the soft tissue and the labrum uh, of the hip. That's perfect. So, so yes, he is a football player. Uh, as you can see, his pain is mainly with activities on his normal day-to-day -day life. He does not have any symptoms. Uh, he has not had any previous uh, treatment. Um, uh, he's just had to ha take some painkillers following a, um, uh, a game. Recently has been unable to finish the game because of the pain, which is really uh, uh, bothering him. Um, in terms of the examination, yes, the uh, fader test or the flexion uh, abduction to rotation test is strongly uh, positive. And you asked for uh, an, uh, a lateral, which um, here is your lateral view. And here is your MRI arthrogram. Yeah. And so looking into this, I think this is a coronal uh, um, MRI T2. I can see that there's abnormality in the labrum. Uh, I think it's, it looks to me as if it is detached from the uh, its original uh, attachment in the bone. Um, um, there is some sort of a cam as well uh, deformity in the uh, uh, head of the femur. Yes. Um, Which you can also appreciate on the sort of lateral view. Um, yeah, I see. Yeah. Yes. yeah. Yes. So uh, given all that, what would you advise this uh, football player then? So the options between an operative and operative, if he's uh, for activity modification, painkillers, if this doesn't work and he's keen for surgery, he will be a candidate for hip arthroscopy, where you try to uh, shave the uh, bump on the femoral head and try to reattach the labrum uh, to its position as well. And uh, he doesn't want to modify his activity level. He's still keen on playing football. Hmm. What sort of uh, evidence can you give him to uh, tell him about the outcome of uh, hip arthroscopy in these cases? I'm sorry, I cannot quote any paper, yeah. so yeah. sorry. So I think, I think you did uh, great, really. And we went through uh, all the uh, history. So basically it's the history, more or less the, the history we, we spoke about in, in the uh, sort of hip dysplasia. The onset of symptoms when it happened is important. Triggering factors is important in these patients because it's usually with uh, certain sports, certain movements, sitting in deep flexion, uh, maybe um, stairs because they also reflex the hip. Driving is one of the triggering factors because of the deep flexion. Um, and usually it's affecting really hobbies more than uh, daily activities, except in later cases. Uh, expectations, which is very important because if uh, you are planning to go back to sports, then uh, that is something that could be, that needs to be uh, discussed and uh, made clear because um, unfortunately not all of them can re go back to the same level of activities that they were in uh, previously. Um, so um, examination, really more or less a normal uh, examination other than uh, the impingement tests being positive. Rotational profile is important. Some of these patients have femoral retroversion uh, a bit different from the uh, dysplasia patients that we said they have femoral antiversion. These, you could have them uh, either ways, but they, we see retroversion more commonly with these patients because the retroversion increases the impingement. And um, uh, management, one of three, non-operative management, but that includes activity or that involves activity modification. So basically it, this is where it's different from the management of dysplasia. So we know about the management of the dysplasia is that 
um, if you do leave it untreated and they are symptomatic, they would then progress to arthritis. But here, if with impingement, the link, there is a link, but it's, it's a weaker link. So these patients, if they modify their activities and they no longer get the pain and they're no longer putting their hips in that impingement position, then there would be no need for surgery. And then there's the option of physiotherapy and surgery. And, and here, you know, we usually, you know, don't need to know much evidence, particularly in topics that are not uh, really common. But, but in, with, with hip arthroscopy in particular, there's two national trials and very, very big um, national trials that were uh, done over the past uh, five years and uh, the FATE trial and the FASHION trial. And it's always good to know about these uh, 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 national trials because it is showing the examiner that you are up to date, you are attending the uh, uh, meetings, the orthopedic meetings, because they are mentioned in every sort of uh, hip arthroscopy meeting done in this country, both of these trials. And they, we get updates uh, almost in every year at the DHS or so on about uh, these trials. So, it, and both of them more or less show the same that whether the physiotherapy group or the arthroscopy group, patients with FAI um, who had physiotherapy, they did improve in, uh, in their outcome scores. The arthroscopy uh, group did also improve, but the improvement in arthroscopy was better uh, or more significant than the improvement in physiotherapy. So although the baseline in arthroscopy was less than the baseline in physiotherapy, the change or the improvement in arthroscopy was higher. So that's these are just two quick papers. I think uh, uh, they'd be good to quote. Uh, and we do mention them to any patient uh, who is uh, heading for hip arthroscopy. And there's now a non-orthoplasty hip registry. This is, I think, the fifth or sixth year now. Uh, not uh, exactly sure, but this captures all uh, hip preservation surgery, including hip arthroscopy. Uh, and, um, and this is also showing uh, good outcomes for hip arthroscopy and improvement in uh, the hip function scores. Now we get to uh, the third topic and perhaps the most important and more common topic in the exam. And this topic I, I, I really wanted to talk about, and I wanted, was thinking of putting it first because I was grilled for five minutes in my exam about this. And I was up to date, maybe maybe not as up to date as I would have wanted to be back then, uh, but uh, um, they did go into details, which I didn't think uh, they would have uh, gone into. Um, so if someone would uh, like to take the lead and, and uh, look at this MRI scan and this brief history and uh, tell us their thoughts. If nobody else is volunteering, Matwali, would you like to uh, volunteer? Ah, Vilas Sadakir, thank you very much. Uh, do you want to go ahead? Hi. So uh, I can see the uh, ape, the um, uh, coronal view of the uh, this particular hip, left hip, which is showing that the sphericity of the head is maintained, but there is a crescent fracture uh, in the uh, uh, left uh, femur. Um, so I would like to go do a triple assessment. I would go, I'll ask for the history uh, about the pain, uh, when it has come and how it has progressed over the period of time. Uh, I would ask the patient about uh, his uh, uh, functional, um, and how is uh, it's affecting his effect, uh, activities of daily living. Uh, I would then ask whether there's any, uh, look out for any etiologies like uh, whether he's got uh, any significant past medical history like sickle, sickle cell anemia, his alcohol intake, uh, yes, exactly. So yeah, um, um, it's very important, and I think a, a, a lot of people would would forget this point. It's important to we do it in day to day life, but in the exam setting, to remember to ask about uh, that in particular, the precipitating factors. Yeah. Uh, I would also ask about whether I mean whether any uh, I mean uh, activities or uh, hobbies that he does like uh, deep sea diving and kind of uh, kind of stuff. Uh, whether he's got any blood disorders. Um, uh, and uh, things. Then I would go for my examination. Uh, in the examination, uh, I would look out for uh, uh, signs of the any uh, fixed deformities in uh, uh, in coronal and sagittal planes. Uh, I would look out for his uh, range of movement uh, and uh, 
uh, and also look out then uh, uh, look out for his neurology. I would then uh, in my uh, in, in my investigations, I would like to uh, do X X ray of uh, pelvis with both the hips. I would also look out for bloods, uh, especially things like uh, uh, liver function uh, test. His uh, any hemo look out for any hemoglobinopathies uh, in his blood, uh, and uh, then uh, go on to discuss the uh, treatment options with the patient. Okay, perfect. And what treatment options then are you going to discuss? So, so he is limping. He is in pain. It is affecting his uh, uh, daily uh, life. Um, in terms of past medical history, he did have a period in, um, when you tried to probe him. He did tell you that over the past couple of years, he's been through a depressing time and he's been drinking um, uh, more than he usually does, uh, about 20 units or so a week. And uh, other than that, uh, he is fit and well. His blood tests haven't shown anything except some uh, change in his liver functions probably because of the uh, alcohol. So this would be uh, avascular necrosis uh, stage 2b uh, because there's a crystal fracture although the specificity of the head of timber is main still maintained. Um, and uh, the option uh, here is uh, uh, at this point of time the hip conservative uh, procedures uh, would not work and I think uh, we will, uh, I'm looking out for options of uh, arthroplasty procedure like a total hip replacement. So would you, you mentioned that the sphericity, he does have a crease in fracture, but you mentioned that the sphericity is still maintained. Yes. Uh, so pre-collapse or post-collapse? Uh, it's pre-collapse. Pre-collapse. So would you, given his young age, maybe consider any hip preservation options for him? So I can do a core decompression with a vascularized uh, fibular transfer, so which I, for which I would need uh, probably uh, a microvascular surgeon's help uh, for this particular case. Uh, I know that uh, the, uh, the chances of, uh, 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 I mean, the principle of the surgery is that we decompress the uh, 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 pressure in the head of the femur caused by the venous stasis uh, and uh, with which uh, I would expect the uh, some of the pain to uh, disappear with time uh, and I would uh, for this particular surgery I would take the help of uh, uh, I would have a I would discuss this case with a senior hip surgeon and uh, we'll we'll have uh, uh, also discuss this with the uh, with the uh, uh, my microvascular pl plastic surgeon before pro proceeding uh, to help with the fibula, vascular fibula graft. Why, why did you choose this uh, option, particularly the vascular fibula graft option? Um, uh, the the reasons for this would uh, are uh, one uh, the uh, uh, biomechanically I know I, I know that this would uh, decrease the venous stasis and the uh, so pressure in the head of the femur and it would improve the head circulation. Uh, I would also I also know that uh, by uh, doing this, the, the there are the other clinical uh, studies which have shown the results to improve. Okay, good. Thank you. Thanks a lot. So um, uh, we'll try to go through them and go through the different procedures. And the problem with the vascular necrosis is is there is no strong evidence to sort of advocate one treatment over the other. There is no consensus and you can't really be wrong or right for choosing a particular uh, option, particularly with the level of evidence that we have for each option, unfortunately. So I'll quickly try to go through them. And this is basically what happened in my exam. I went through the options. I told them which option I, I'd pick and, uh, and I was asked how I would do it. Uh, so that's what I'll try to do uh, today. Um, so, Etiology, it's a long list of etiologies. This is just a, a, a snapshot of them. Uh, trauma, probably the most uh, common. Uh, steroids and alcohol, uh, that's the most common of the non-traumatic uh, causes. Um, uh, and then you've got sickle cell, you've got chemotherapy and so on. Pathophysiology, also particularly for the basic science, that with the blood supply of the femoral head is one of the very common questions. Uh, in the uh, uh, in basic sciences, not going to go through the details, but basically it's one of uh, one of these four: either a trauma, direct interruption of the blood supply, or increased pressure 
inside the femoral head, head because of the uh, cell hypertrophy uh, or, or fat cell hypertrophy. This is one of the mechanisms thought to be caused by steroid use, emboli such as sickle cell or caseous disease, and idiopathic. Uh, and some cases you just don't find a, a cause. Um, imaging, um, you'd, uh, uh, you'd usually need to mention a lateral view. And the case that I got in, in my uh, Viva, there was really nothing to see on the AP view. And, and when I did mention lateral view, they did show me a, an X-ray of a lateral with a very, very subtle cyst uh, on the lateral view. And that was basically the uh, uh, sort of clue of AVN. That and the fact that they had told me uh, that the patient had chemotherapy a year before. So on the lateral view, you're looking for cystic changes or sclerosis or crescent sign. MRI, it's very important. That is positive before the radiographs. It shows you the location of the lesion, the size of the lesion and the articular collapse. The location size and the collapse is basically what's going to uh, guide our management here. You can mention bone scan. I'm not aware of a center that does it. Uh, um, um, it's, uh, you get a, a, a ring of, of cold uh, uh, area followed by, uh, sorry, a center of cold area followed by a ring of uptake and uh, some uh, literature, they call it the donut sign. Classification, there are plenty of classification systems and the, really what's common between them all are two things. Number one, they all have poor inter-observer reliability. And number two, they all try to categorize the patients into pre-collapse and post-collapse. And uh, FICAT is, is uh, uh, one of the most common uh, we use. Um, Steinberg is a modification of it. There's the ARCO classification, which is a more complex classification. It takes into consideration the size and the location. And there's the Japanese uh, classification it takes the uh, size into consideration. But more or less, we're talking about has, is there collapse or is there no collapse? And that's what would direct you pre-collapse, hip preservation, post-collapse, uh, then no hip preservation. Okay. Uh, non-operative uh, treatment. Um, so non-operative treatment is for the small lesions and for the asymptomatic patients and if surgery is contraindicated. Um, restricted weight bearing um, has not shown uh, to be of any uh, use in preventing collapse. Uh, so that's something you can, you can also uh, mention that you're not going to restrict. Some patients, some, some would advocate to restrict them anyways, as that's not going to really, if that's not going to be of much harm to them. As you can see, while we talk about this, you always find that the, in, in every one of these topics, you'll find some evidence available for one thing and evidence that contradicts it on the other side, which what makes it uh, quite difficult is phosphonates. There's been recent, recently a lot of talk about this phosphonates and their use, but again, contradicting evidence, some showing uh, uh, it can prevent collapse and others showing no benefit. And um, like this paper, for example, in the American uh, JBC <coughs> showing that that uh, they did not find any benefit of using uh, zolondronate uh, in stage one or stage two uh, osteonecrosis. In the UK, there was a trial or a, uh, the Mantis trial, uh, which was meant to be a randomized control trial between bisphosphonates and placebo. And again, I always have uh, the feeling that these national trials are good to mention in the uh, exam. Um, However, uh, this trial fortunately was abandoned due to recruitment problems. And the recruitment problem uh, with uh, osteonecrosis is because uh, patients usually present quite late after they've had collapse. So by the time they present, then they're not eligible to be included into the trial. And also putting in mind that osteonecrosis is a very wide group of patients. You've got patients with idiopathic osteonecrosis or patients with reversible causes of osteonecrosis uh, that have had steroids for a period of their life and they're not on it anymore. But you've got unreversible causes. You've got sickle cell, you've got uh, lupus. All of these, they continue to have uh, the precipitating factor of their uh, osteonecrosis. So it's difficult to conduct a study with this heterogeneous group of patients that, as I mentioned, usually present uh, late. Uh, other forms of medical treatment that you'll find in literature, statins, clixane, uh, hyperbaric oxygen, vasodilators, um, um, iloprost, 
Um, however, all the evidence is still uh, weak for all of them. Now, the most common surgical procedure, and probably the one I would mention in my exam, just to try to avoid, uh, again, you're, you're free to pick whatever uh, management you think is appropriate or whatever management you are used to doing in, in your hospital. But um, I think my point of view in the exam, I would stick to the core decompression. Why? Because it's the most common procedure that is performed. And uh, usually the question would then be, how would you perform it? I would perform it first. I'd look at the MRI scan, look at where the lesion is so that I could plan where my drill holes would be. I would put the patient on a, a traction table without applying traction, the, just on the traction table so I can get good views of the hip. Instead of using one large drill, when this was originally uh, uh, described, it was described with a large drill, nine millimeters or 10 millimeters uh, to find, but I would use multiple small drills and the evidence has shown no difference in outcome between using one drill or multiple small drills. The only difference is you get less risk of uh, uh, fracture with multiple small drills. I would target the area of a vascular necrosis with one or two or three, depending on its uh, size. Um, what evidence do I have? Originally, when uh, Fika uh, mentioned his, uh, uh, this treatment technique, um, he reported a 90% success in the pre-collapse phase. Uh, however, recent uh, studies have shown less, uh, so it goes down to 63% uh, or so. Um, then there's um, another option that's used in this country uh, called an X-Rim, if uh, some of you are aware of it. It's more or less the same. Uh, it's a core decompression. You aim it at the lesion, and then you uh, inject a uh, bone substitute. Uh, and the studies, which are sort of case series rather than uh, level one studies, are quoting 80 to 90 percent success rate. And there's non-vascularized bone grafts, filling it with cortical uh, autografts, and studies have shown better survivorship than just core decompression. There's uh, vascularized bone grafts. Uh, uh, we're taking a fibula with its nutrient artery and anastomosing it to the branch of a lateral circumflex. Uh, you'd need microsurgery for it. And uh, studies are also, the studies that advocate for this are suggesting that it does have even better outcomes than the non-vascularized option. Then comes the femoral osteotomy, which if I were to mention, I would mention really uh, at briefly, and I would not really advocate uh, for it. It does aim to offload the necrotic area. The choice of osteotomy would differ according to where the necrotic area is. Usually the necrotic area is anterolateral, so it's a vulgus flexion osteotomy and the studies are quoting 80 to 90 percent success. The main disadvantage here is why I would stay away from it in, in my exam setting is because this might compromise your hip replacement later on. So I'm going to prevent you definitely from fall doing a hip replacement, but we'll make it a challenging hip replacement. And usually when hip preservation in surgery, one of the main things you think about is you think about the next surgery because these are young patients, they're likely to require surgery again through their life. You doing an osteotomy now is, is a big uh, undertaking for a patient that might then eventually require a visit. Trapdoor procedure, again, has been even uh, described in, in late stages, stage three or four, it involves a surgical hip dislocation, uh, involves uh, opening a trapdoor in the cartilage, removing the necrotic bone and putting in uh, uh, bone graft uh, uh, in the uh, necrotic uh, area. And again, quoting um, success rate in 80% in, in stage three, but these results are not reproduced in other centers. So um, just, just to, to see how, you know, as an example of how my Viva went in, in that particular topic. I sort of went through all of these options, including the medical options. This phosphonates, perhaps I wasn't really up to date, but I said there's no evidence that, you know, it is of use and which turned out to be what should have been, uh, which is uh, this case. Trapdoor procedure, uh, surprisingly, that's where the discussion then went into the trapdoor procedure. And then we started talking about what is the safe surgical uh, hip dislocation. And as I was uh, describing the surgical uh, hip, uh, sort of safe dislocation of the hip, uh, that's when the bell rang. And I think they were quite happy uh, with uh, the Viva. Uh, total hip replacement, this is your salvage procedure post-collapse. 
um, you could argue that it could be done from the start in cases with non-reversible etiology or a lar large size region. Historically, and, and this is where some the words you could you could fall into this trap. If if you've been reading some old literature or or studying from some older uh, textbooks, then uh, you it it used to classically say that they have lower outcomes um, than uh, hip replacement for osteoarthritis. Recent literature has not shown that. If anything, they have shown comparable results with total hip replacement for osteoarthritis. The difference really is not the cause, not the, uh, the AVM, the difference is that these are a younger cohort of patients. And usually the younger cohorts of patients, they get more incidence of loosening or so on because of their activity level or so. But generally speaking, no, that it is comparable results to osteoarthritis for total hip replacement with some exceptions for, uh, depending on the etiology. So in sickle cell, generally they have, they do uh, worse because of uh, uh, their bone quality and of renal disease also because of their uh, bone quality. And uh, that's about it really. Um, uh, we, can, we can try to, to cover more topics in young adult hip uh, in later sessions, but I think these three are the most common uh, in the FRCS. Uh, thank you. Uh, the, sorry, thank you very much. Quick question, please. Yeah. yeah the safe surgical dislocation is the GANS operation yes. for the... Yes. Uh, can, can you take us through quickly uh, how is it done, please? Yeah, so I, I don't have the slides now, but basically it's it's you start off with a approach, a posterior, uh, like a posterior approach to the hip. And then uh, you need to identify the vastus lateralis and uh, you need to identify the uh, abductors and the GT. And then you do your osteotomy, a, a biplanar osteotomy into the GT leaving the vastus intact and elevating the gluteus, uh, gluteus medius with the or trochanteric osteotomy, leaving the gluteus minimus uh, attached to the trochanter. And, um, and then that exposes the anterior hip, the capsule of the hip, where you do a Z-shaped osteotomy. And then and there you could do a Z or you could do a T, Z is the more uh, common one, and then you dislocate the hip. Uh, anteriorly, preserving all the posterior structures. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, you. Willie. That's an excellent talk. Um, and I, what I really liked was the part of the talk where you uh, you reckon you explained that these are not straightforward cases, and that in the exam, if you're presented one of these cases, don't just plow straight into "I will do, I will do." Recognize that it's not a straightforward case; it requires a specific young hip expertise, and uh, that the these cases uh, require consultation with someone who has more experience in these things. Because as you have explained correctly, that the majority of us won't come across these young hip uh, type cases as management, but as a, a re regional referral. Yes, that's correct. Uh, thank you very much. Um, there are a couple of other questions. Would you do a hip preserving surgery for non-idiopathic AVM as well? For non-idiopathic AVM, or do you mean idiopathic? It's a, the question is non-idiopathic. So, so, yeah. So, when when you're when you're doing a hip preservation surgery for AVM, you do aim to stop the uh, precipitating factor if you can stop it. Uh, so, alcohol you advise against, uh, but there are things that you will not be able to stop. And and the problem with AVM is that you're always put in this situation. You put a situation. You get a young youngish patient. Uh, who has either reversible or non-reversible cause of uh, AVM, and uh, you've got a surgery that doesn't give you a good outcome, uh, and there's no strong evidence to advocate one surgery over the other, but at the same time, you cannot, as a hip surgeon, watch this patient just develop arthritis and leave him the way he is. So you basically opt in for a surgery, um, counseling the patient and telling him that we're going to do this surgery, the outcome is 60% or the outcome is 70%. And there is a chance of failure. And if that fails, then we're talking about the hip replacement. 
So yes, if, when, in all cases, whether it's idiopathic, non-idiopathic, yes, hip preservation surgery, providing there is no collapse. Once there is collapse, then, then um, I think the options are, are no longer valid. And um, a question from me, if you have a patient who has progressed in their AVN and is uh, deteriorated to the point where they need a uh, joint replacement, your approach to the hip replacement would be different depending on what's the source of the AVN or cause of AVN? How would you? So, so, so that, that, that's, that's a good question. And, and, and surprisingly, I really haven't found a solid answer for that. Um, I remember when I was revising through uh, Banaskovic, uh, uh, the, um, uh, they were talking about using uncemented rather than cemented stems because of the AVN, um, but I haven't seen any evidence for that. And the AVN is in the head, it's not in the uh, uh, stem and it's not in the socket. So once you've removed the head, there is no logic that would say that one is better than the other. And uh, from my, uh, my sort of experience from where I work, it's what implants you use or what approach you use is patient uh, uh, based rather than a specific implant, particularly for it. what you use is what you go for, basically, rather than changing it because that patient has AVM. The only difference really is if you do hip resurfacing. If you do hip resurfacing, then that's something uh, else. And, and yes, you could do hip resurfacing for patients with uh, AVM, but uh, uh, there are concerns with that, uh, big major concerns with that. Okay. Um, and uh, another question uh, from Bulas. Um, any, any timelines in terms of preservation surgery? How early to prioritize on waiting lists? Pre collapse, uh, pre, yeah, yeah, on the waiting list. So these patients go ahead of the waiting list. If, they're pre, if you find a pre collapse patient, which you don't find a lot, and um, I was talking to uh, the consultant I work with, uh, uh, basically over his sort of 10 years of uh, practice in young adult hip, he's come around, you know, about 10, 12 patients of these pre collapse. So it's once a year that you see a patient like this who is actually a candidate for surgery. So, yes, when you do pick them up, these patients are given priority within the next few weeks. Within six weeks, usually is ideally what we aim for, if not sooner. So even through COVID, I remember when we were not operating electively, we did uh, pick up a patient and um, we did do him despite the COVID restrictions in the hospital at that time. Uh, so yes, these are done in a, in a more urgent uh, case. Thank you. If there's no more questions, um, we'll uh, end the uh, lecture part of this uh, talk. Um, excellent talk, really. Very important uh, topic. Really, we appreciate it. Thank you so much. And we really well explained. Um, you guys will have a chance to go over the YouTube video. We'll put it on the uh, our channel. Um, but uh, it's worth rereading this and re going through the video uh, because it is an important, uh, th these topics are very important in the exam. Uh, thank you very much, for everybody. Um, if uh, we will stop the recorded part of our section and move on to the viva section, um, please, uh, we, uh, we'll see you soon. Anyone who's watching this YouTube video for future reference wishes to register to come to the live sessions, including the live viva sessions. You can go to the frcsmentor.co.uk website uh, and from there register for the different talks and private sessions. Uh, thank you very much, everybody.